Malta is one of the most mysterious islands in the world. A prehistoric civilization once thrived here, building megalithic sites all over the landscape. One such site is a temple complex known as Gigantia that likely features some of the oldest Cyclopean blocks on the planet. Now, legends abound of a race of ancient giants that once ruled this island. Uh, for example, this very site of Gigantia, oral, oral traditions whisper that a giant named Sansuna is said to have actually constructed this site. Now, unlike uh, many other megalithic sites found around the globe in places such as Peru or Egypt uh, that are made of granite, most of the stone on the island of Malta is limestone, which is much softer than granite. Uh, therefore, all the sites that are above ground here on Malta are severely eroded uh, by the ages of time. Uh, however, one of the best preserved and most mysterious sites found on Malta is hidden underground. Known as the Hypogeum Hall Soflini, this subterranean labyrinth of interconnecting elliptical chambers was hewn and engineered straight from the limestone bedrock and features three different levels. Hypogeum is a Greek word, I believe, uh, that means underground. And it has been estimated that more than 2,000 tons of limestone were likely quarried out and removed for its construction. A UNESCO World Heritage Site, this megalithic marvel is dated by mainstream academia to go back to the prehistoric period of at least 4,000 BC, uh, likely making it the oldest underground necropolis temple in the world. But could it actually be even older than that? Now, this entire structure is believed to have once been covered in prehistory by a surface shrine or a temple structure that covered it, uh, but was eventually destroyed later on. And when it was destroyed, it obviously would have covered up the entrances into this labyrinth uh, underneath. So I guess that's the silver lining with the overhead structure falling apart, is it basically kept the uh, uh, subterranean part hidden uh, for thousands upon thousands of years. Because it wasn't until 1902 when the structure was uncovered by accident, when workers uh, began construction on a nearby housing development. So they find the structure a year later in 1903 of the first excavations of the site began and they were led by a Jesuit father who was also an archaeologist named uh, Emmanuel Magri. Now this first archaeologist Magri uh, oversaw the project for five years until his sudden death in 1907. Now sadly his notes disappeared along with him and efforts to find and retrieve them uh, have been unsuccessful. The Hall Soflini Hypogeum is one of the best preserved and most extensive ancient structures that have survived into modern times. Now, the ground level of the site features this trilithon style stone entrance and also a shaft that descends down to this mid level. The mid-level descends down to about 20 feet below the ground level, and it's the largest of all the levels. It's got over 20 different chambers on this mid-level. And on this mid-level are a few more Trilithon stone-style entrances uh, that were also constructed. Now, the most fascinating part of this mid-level chamber, if not the entire hypogeum, is what is known as the Oracle Chamber. And this gets me excited because this contains a carved out niche in the wall with a rounded interior surface. Now anything spoken into this niche produces an echo which reverberates throughout the entire hypogeum. 
and apparently it echoes from the speaking chamber or this oracle chamber uh, reverberate into a rhythm that is similar to the human heartbeat. So it's like a word spoken in this oracle chamber is magnified over and over, apparently almost like a hundredfold, and it's audible throughout the entire structure. According to some accounts, it creates an effect that is like being inside a giant bell. And at certain pitches, the listener feels the sound literally almost vibrating in their bones and tissues as much as they hear it in their ears. According to arts and architecture critic Richard Storm, who's been inside this uh, resonance chamber, he says, quote, because you sense something coming from somewhere else you can't identify, you are transfixed, end quote. Also, Maltese composer Ruben Zara and an Italian research team found that sound resonates at 110 hertz within the oracle chamber. Research done by the University of Siena has shown that the construction of the chamber was made in a way to affect the psyche of people. Some researchers even believe this chamber was most likely the place where the priests would produce sound that would enhance the effectivity of their strange rituals. More and more research seems to be finding that the effect on the psyche of the ancients through acoustic properties uh, suggest the builders of these sites had knowledge of this process and probably used it to enhance their rituals. So it's amazing that without the use of modern day metals, these ancients of Malta were erecting one of the first domed structures on earth that incorporated highly advanced acoustics. Uh, again, very similar to what I've seen in Peru and in many places in Egypt. I've also got to point out that on this level, this mid-level, is what's known as the painted chamber by some. And it features these spiral and honeycomb designs made of red ochre, uh, this mineral pigment. And these decorations are elaborate and supposedly they're, they're the only prehistoric wall paintings found on the Maltese islands. There is also a circular chamber on the mid-level that's known as the snake pit. And this is where some of the most fascinating artifacts discovered in the hypogeum were found in this snake pit chamber. And uh, one of them depicts uh, what is a woman lying on a bed or couch. And it's come to be known as the sleeping lady. Now, Temi Zamet, the second archaeologist who took over for the first one, and this guy was excavating in the early 1900s as well, he stated that he believed this statue of the sleeping lady represented a priestess dreaming near the sacred places in the hope of obtaining inspiration to declare the words of the holy oracle. Now underneath the mid-level is the third level, which is closed to the public, but it descends down to 33 feet below ground level. Uh, we're definitely going to get more into the third level uh, at the end of this episode, and I'm going to share with you a very strange account uh, that supposedly happened in this third level. So don't miss that. But first, let's talk about the skulls. Now, after the sudden death of the original archaeologist Emmanuel Magri in 1907, excavations continued under this archaeologist named Temi Zamet. Now, it's important to point out that uh, Zamet uh, proved himself to be not merely an archaeologist, but he was a brilliant medical doctor, apparently one of Malta's best ever doctors. And so by virtue of his medical training, um, it's also known that he was a very capable physical anthropologist. So that's, I think, very important to note when we read about what um, 
Temi Zamet stated regarding all the skeletons and skulls that were discovered inside uh, the hypogeum. So in 1926, uh, Temi Zamet uh, states that he discovered over 7,000. That's right, 7,000 skeletons piled within various chambers of the hypogeum. And he described uh, most of the skulls as being, quote, of the long variety, end quote. Now, one of Zamet's students who was excavating under his supervision was named W.A. Griffiths. And he stated in uh, the book written by Zamet that, quote, most of the rooms were found to be half filled with earth, human bones, and broken pottery. It has been estimated that the ruins contained the bones of 33,000 persons, mostly adults. Practically all were found in the greatest disorder, and there had evidently been no regular burial of a complete body." End quote. Now, these numbers that these original excavators are using are incredible. I mean, we're hearing 33,000 possible uh, skeletons represented, 7,000 skeletons piled up. Uh, this is crazy. In one particular area that Zamet and his team excavated, they write how the bones lay so thickly that in a space of about four cubic yards, lay the remains of no less than 120 individuals. So this thing was literally packed with human bones and skeletons. And I might talk about this in a little bit, but I don't believe this uh, hypogeum was originally just built to be a, a burial tomb. Uh, I think that as years went on, later civilizations and inhabitants used it uh, to bury their dead. And, and just throw them in there. Now, as I begin to look into these skulls deeper and read the writings of these original archeologists and other researchers that I'm gonna reference here soon, it's obvious that these skulls feature strange genetic anomalies. Uh, some of that would include cranial knitting lines, abnormally developed temporal partitions. There's even evidence of drilling and swelling at the back of the heads. And these elongated skulls are also missing the sagittal sutures. Uh, that to me is very genetic. Now it is known and been documented uh, by some that some of these skulls were on display in the archeological museum in Valletta on Malta up until the early 1980s. However, after 1985, all the skulls that had been found in the hypogeum, along with other elongated skulls found across multiple ancient sites on Malta, uh, were all removed from public display by Heritage Malta. This is the authority responsible for uh, Malta's prehistoric heritage. Now, Heritage Malta insists that they have the skulls have been available for scientific research. However, only a handful of people seem to have actually been granted permission to view them. One of these uh, people was Dr. Anton Mifsud, who published articles detailing the skull's elongation. Now his research confirmed that the craniums were naturally long and not the result of head binding. Notice how I said that part kind of slow, <laughs> because that is always uh, the answer I get back if I talk about elongated skulls or post a photo, oh, that's that's cradle headboarding or that's head binding. Yeah, many skulls are headboarded or head binded, and that's why the shape is altered. Uh, but there's many skulls on earth, such as these, I believe, in Malta, that are naturally long. It means they were born that way. So again, this Dr. Anton Miff said, uh, published articles um, detailing the skull's elongation on Malta. And uh, the paper that I read through is called The Elite Longheads of Malta. So he's obviously insinuating that uh, these long-headed, elongated, skulled 
peoples or humanoids were uh, elite or were the ruling class of their age. That's interesting to think about. So in this publication, The Elite Longheads of Malta, a myth said, uh, draws parallels and conclusions related to the Egyptian culture and their so-called serpent priests. Now, I believe it was the second archaeologist, Zamet, who uh, wrote somewhere that the majority of the bones and skulls that they were finding inside the hypo hypogeum uh, basically fell to dust and crumbled upon the first touch, and that only about 20 of them really remained intact. Now, out of these 20, the whereabouts of only six of the skulls are supposedly currently known today. And what remains to testify of their existence and abnormality are the photos um, that this Dr. Anton Mifsud and his colleague, Dr. Charles Ventura, uh, detailed in their books uh, about the abnormalities of the skulls. Uh, during the 80s and 90s, this Dr. Anton Mifsud managed to capture a few photographs of the then surviving six skulls uh, that were exhibited at the National Museum of Archaeology in Valletta. So if you're watching this by video, you're going to see uh, now or soon photos of these skulls on the screen. So in his publication titled The Elite Longheads of Malta, Mifsud stated, quote, Great reluctance prevails on the part of several members of the local archaeological establishment to acknowledge the true nature of our Maltese ancestors. The evidence of Paleolithic art in Malta has been wiped out. At the present time, the long-headedness of the late Neolithic Maltese is being challenged in the very same spot where these people practiced their religious rituals in the Hal Saflini hypogeum." End quote. So from a guy who's spent a lifetime uh, researching the hypogeum and these skulls found inside and traveling to Malta, uh, or he might even live in Malta actually, this myth said, those are some pretty damning statements about the mainstream archaeological community and the seemingly uh, cover-up that it is has ensued regarding the site and these skulls. Now, Mifsud goes on to uh, write in his book that the two publications that had measured the skulls in 1910 and 1911 both pronounced all the hypogeum skulls as long-headed or elongated. And the 1910 measurements had been carried out in accordance with the rules laid down by the International Congress for the Unification of Craniometric Measures of 1907. Two men by the name of Vittorio di Cesar and Adriano Forgione of Hara or Hera magazine in Rome, Italy, these were the two only non-officials to obtain permission, apparently, to investigate these hypogeum skulls. And they published a very uh, thorough article regarding their findings. Now, their research confirmed that the cranium of these skulls was naturally long and not the result of bandaging or boards. And they couldn't find any evidence of median knitting or sagittal sutures. Now, in 1920, National Geographic magazine, in their January to June issue, reported that the first inhabitants of Malta were a race with elongated skulls. And they, in the article, they wrote, quote, From an examination of the skeletons of the polished Stone Age, it appears that the early inhabitants of Malta were a race of long-skulled people of lower medium height, akin to the early people of Egypt, who spread westward along the north coast of Africa, whence some went to Malta and Sicily and others to Sardinia and Spain, end quote. So to me, it's ironic that we've got National Geographic, which today is considered the mainstream uh, gatekeeper or one of them of all things history, right? In the 1920s, they're writing that uh, these rulers of Malta 
were um, elongated skulled peoples. Now this next paragraph I'm going to read you really caught my attention. I've heard a lot about this story over the years and always been intrigued by it, but I had never heard this part until uh, just a couple weeks ago. Anton Mifsud, uh, author and researcher who wrote this uh, book called The Elite Longheads of Malta, in writing about the cover-up of this site and these skulls, he writes the following, uh, quote, The entire structure had risked total collapse during its refurbishment because of neglect. Crucial artifacts, such as a painted bull, had been erased from one of the walls on the second level, and a large six-fingered hand had been engraved on another wall, had been obscured into oblivion. These acts had been perpetrated through the irresponsible activities of certain senior archaeologists." End quote. And he's again talking about his visits to the Hypogeum in the 80s and 90s, I believe. Mifsud also wrote that in 1973, uh, a very large quantity of human remains were also discovered at a smaller Hypogeum site in uh, Santa Lucia, called the Santa Lucia Hypogeum. And these have never ever been exhibited as well and their present day whereabouts is unknown. Let's wrap this up by getting back to the topic of the third level of the Hypogeum. I believe it was the second archaeologist, Zamet, who wrote that a number of seven specific steps led from the middle level of the Hypogeum down towards the lower level. And remember that I stated earlier, the third level descends down to 33 feet below ground level. And this third level is now closed to the public. And there may be a reason for this. Again, according to National Geographic magazine, in their August 1940 publication, uh, they wrote an article that was titled Wanderers a Wheel in Malta. And the subheading was Tragedy in Malta's Tunneled Maze. And this is written by the author Richard Walter. And I'm going to read it for you now. Quote, Prehistoric man built temples and chambers in these vaults. In a pit beside one sacrificial altar lie thousands of of human skeletons. While we cycled homeward, our friends told us that the island was honeycombed with a network of underground passages, many of them catacombs. Years ago, one could walk underground from one end of Malta to the other, but all entrances were closed by the government because of a tragedy. On a sightseeing trip, comparable to a nature study tour in our own schools. A number of elementary school children and their teachers descended into the tunneled maze and did not return. For weeks, mothers declared that they had heard wailing and screaming from underground, but numerous excavations and search parties brought no trace of the lost souls. After three weeks, they were finally given up for dead. So that is a literal article from the August 1940 National Geographic magazine. There's some other uh, publications out there that I believe shared the story, but National Geographic uh, would be the biggest. A crazy account, uh, if true. And that to me is what is so amazing and mysterious about this site. You've got this beautiful island with these prehistoric megalithic structures all over the surface. Uh, we talked about one of the other ones at the beginning of the show. And then you've got the Hypogeum itself, which is uh, just incredible ancient engineering, subterranean. Um, but it's not just that. You've got the Oracle Chamber. You've got resonance and acoustics. We've got artifacts 
of the Sleeping Lady. We've got these incredible, colorful red ochre uh, paintings. We've got a depiction of a six-fingered hand on one of the walls of the Hypogeum. We've got all these skeletons with elongated skulls and um, odd genetic anomalies that were discovered inside the structure. And sadly, if true, we also have uh, missing people that went down into this subterranean structure to the third level and were never seen again. So you've got all these different aspects. To me, it makes for an incredible story. Uh, this is an incredible ancient structure full of so much mystery and intrigue. And it really brings so many questions to light. Why were all these elongated skulls um, in Malta removed from public display after 1985? And it wasn't, again, just from the Hypogeum, but it was these other sites too uh, where elongated, naturally elongated skulls were discovered. Why are they now only available apparently to researchers? These should be the greatest uh, artifacts and specimens on display there in the National Museum of Archaeology on Malta. You know, does this cover-up have anything to do with the sudden death of the original archaeologist, Emmanuel Magri, and uh, his reports that disappeared? Why were they never found? Why were they never published? And why has the number, original numbers of skeletons changed from 33,000 to 7,000? Uh, I saw 100 somewhere down to 20, and now apparently there's only six left. I get that, you know, some schools are going to crumble and they're just going to fall apart, um, but only six. I also can't help but wonder why were these ancient elongated skulled peoples or humanoids of Malta living underground? Were they somehow survivors of a great ancient cataclysm, maybe a solar disaster, solar flare, and they had to get underground uh, to survive? And or were these elite long-headed humanoids uh, using this subterranean chamber for uh, ritual purposes? Were they abducting uh, normal humans on the surface and enslaving them underground? Were they using the resonance chamber to transfix, to hypnotize, to seduce their captives? Were these elongated skulled peoples uh, hybrid humanoids of sorts? Uh, that's what I lean towards. Uh, did these elongated skulls give them telepathic communication abilities? And does that relate again to the Oracle Chamber? So many questions regarding this site. Uh, but one thing is for certain. There is a whole lot of mystery in Malta.